Hello, everybody. Hello, Lisa. Hello. <laughs> Tell us what you're going to play today. Um, I'm going to play uh, Beethoven Sonata Number no. Two in A Major, uh, first movement. Beautiful. Whenever you're ready.
very very good lisa um excellent work very conscientious approach you have excellent sense of rhythm you kept the tempo throughout and you listened very well i liked your um especially soft soft touch you have very nice soft sound um really if i were looking at the big picture the only thing i could ask for would be for you to play with a bit more character and energy and i think um that will come naturally to you as you work more on the piece and get more confident in your approach to it um, it's like turning the knob up at all your big moments and and feeling like you don't have to hold back you don't have to be shy about them okay but um excellent work and we'll just kind of start from the beginning so talk to me about how you hear the opening characters do you hear this and that as one character or two characters good excellent yeah i hear them as two characters as well um i feel like this character is a little bit fatter and then this one is small and wiry let's just kind of assume those those two images for the moment so i would like you to paint for me in sound how the small and wiry character would sound like like he would have a pipsqueak voice probably um, something very chirpy and cheerful and so for that voice i'd like you to voice the top as much as you can and and hide the thumb of your right hand very good very good so the staccatos it matters how short they are for that pip squeak voice if you play them sort of nicely with a nice release hand they'll, they're gonna sound kind of rounded and so the character is going to start filling in. If you want to keep them small and, and, and chirpy, you want the staccato to be like a hot potato. You touch it and you're like, oh, that's too hot. So imagine touching a key like that. Can you show me how hot the key is? Ah, yes. That has a, a very different energy about it. Do you feel it? Yes. So that's how you want to approach that first character with that kind of hot energy. Try it all together. That's very good. Excellent. Yes. Now the fat character has this sort of soothing bass quality, right? Like velvety tones and you know he kind of likes to sit rather than stand and run around so that last note is a little fuller and longer in value so you have a very big difference between i wouldn't put this the second note on pedal because it doesn't make it as chirpy as sharp as the character is but i would um I would hold the note of the bigger character to its full value to emphasize how cushiony that character is. So can you try now this? Yes. And try to imagine how the cushiony character would sound. Play it with um, expression and imagery like the energy of it that's right yeah like almost almost laughing at it at at yourself but at the same time being very serious about it yes that was excellent so now 
Let's compare them, like, you know, the, the, the chirp. Well, actually, the last note, you know, I'm almost in the habit of playing it long, but really it's not. It should be the same shortness. Some additions will put staccato there, some additions will not, but it's my heart belief that it should stay in the, in the character of the chirpy bun. Okay, let's try it all together. Very good, very good, Lisa. Um, the only thing I would add is that the chirpy character seems to win, don't you think? Yeah, he has the last word. So, I like how you increased. And I would continue that logic. And without getting loud necessarily, play the last statement, the biggest, and then taper it to the end, like he retreats. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, that was really great. Just play this with a, a bit more confidence and you're gonna be golden. This is, this is really good. Now, um, the next statement starts with what dynamic marking in a score? Forte piano, right? So that means that the first note is actually forte. The next note is actually piano. So there is this huge contrast. And it's not just about dynamics. It's about something happening that music sort of portrays or accompanies an event. So I want you to play that event, whatever it is in your mind, with great burst of energy on forte, and then immediately retreat into piano. It might take you a moment to do that shift from forte to piano, and that's okay. Take that time. Can you try it? Excellent, excellent. Um, it's hard to do right on the second note. That's why I, I said, enjoy the forte. Let it ring and then continue piano. So it'll take you a slightly longer moment to let the forte ring. Yes, very good. How loud? How sort of roaring can you make your left hand be? Ah, see, now I hear it. <laughs> yeah, the first one was sort of like a cat's meow. <laughs> the second one was a lion's roar. Yeah? Can you roar with both hands? Yes, yes, Lisa, that's excellent. Now, in order for us to really experience the roar and then the chirping afterwards, what I'd like you to do is just start with the chirp, chirp character right from the second note. If there weren't a, a forte piano at the beginning, how would you shape that line? Where does that line go? it goes there, right? So it means it sort of shapes up. Because there is a forte in the beginning, you have a tendency to shape it down, to kind of taper it. So it goes, and it dies out. But you just indicated yourself that it should shape up and go to the E. I completely agree with that. Can you show me that without the forte first? 
Yes, and show me that it actually arrives at the E. Yes, it has to be expressive. It has to say, I've arrived here. Okay? And start from the second note, because the A really belongs to forte. The piano starts with B. Yes, I like it very much how you did it this time, because you took a little bit of approach to the E. You didn't just go into it straight. And that's what indicates to us that it actually goes there. Okay, now we're going to do two things. We're going to roar. Take time to hear the roar and then play the second shape. No, no, no. I, that's not what I said, Lisa. Listen carefully. You're going to roar. Listen to it. Let it sink in to your ears. Then play the second shape. I want you to take time between the roar and the second shape. Lisa, roar and stop. But really roar, really roar with energy. Yes, and go to the A. I want to hear the top note. Yes, with energy, just like rip it off. Yes. Now, that kind of um, ripple through the, through the arpeggiated chord, that's what you need to experience at the beginning of that roar, with that kind of energy, with that kind of gesture. So I want you to really rip, rip it off and then pause. I want you to experience how that rippling effect feels. Okay, and did you, that's not exactly what I asked, but that's okay. Did you notice how you shaped it not up but down? Yes, yes. That, that's why I wanted you to pause, because you're so used to playing loud at the beginning and then tapering down that it's almost like one thing for you now. And I wanted to separate it in your mind and make it two distinct gestures. That's why I wanted you to pause be before going on. You understand? Okay. That's much better. Much better. Yeah. That shows me both the contrast in the, in the dynamics and how, how the rest of the phrase actually needs to shape. That was very good. So make sure you sing the end of that phrase very clearly. The tops need to project over the middle voices. Project a lot more with a lot more weight into the piano. Yes, and Yes, that chirpy character, yeah, always finishes with this kind of twinkle in the, in, in the eye, with softly but with energy. That's right. Good, good. Let's, let's go on. Now there is a dialogue, probably the cushiony character comes back. Yes, and always, that was great. I liked your cushiony character, it had a lot of expression. 
And then when the chirpy character answered, I liked how you phrased it. You really brought it to the E this time. Your ear is beginning to hear it that way, which is great. So there was a lot of dialogue going on there, uh, which I liked very much. It was more conscious. Let's try it again. It was even more attention to it, more intention to do a dialogue. Make the, the cushiony character even more sort of big and velvety. Play into the keys. Very good. And then how do you finish? How do you end? Yes. So the, with that twinkle and the hot potato touch. That's right. That's right. It gives it a lot of polish, actually. And, and a lot of intention, which we love to see in music. We love to see it characterized very clearly. Good, keep going. So this time, everything you just done, but big. Um, do, you hear, do you hear how you, you sort of play the second note on pedal without really thinking about it? That's a habit you have. So I would advise making it a lot more um, pronounced in difference. So. Yes, I would say both characters are now playing big. Even bigger. That's right, that's right. And then make sure you release the note. Don't just hold it indefinitely because it softens that character. I would say, can you analyze what you just did? So you did this. How does that sound to you? No, it's okay. You don't have to answer. You can just do it again. So the first character, we want to focus on not using pedal form. It, it, it sort of washes him out if you do. So energetic staccato touch. And how do you feel? about why, why would you think to play the next one um, on piano? Yeah, yeah, because now they're both like close up. They were maybe far away, and so we played them soft, like we can't quite see them, they're little dots. Now they came all the way to our line of vision. Now we can see them in all full detail. So that means you have to present them to us with lots of confidence and lots of sound. Beethoven says forte throughout. I would follow that. I wouldn't water it down and make it soft. And then what happens? Um, does the dynamic change? No, it continues forte. It's one of Beethoven's rules that if you don't see any indications of dynamic change, you assume that the previous dynamic holds. So now, the character is big. And kind of struts. Do you know the, the word strutting? Sort of walking with attitude? Yeah. You're a ballet dancer, right? Can you walk with attitude? <laughs> I bet you can. Now, can you sound like you're walking with attitude? Yeah, that was much
much better. I would say even more, Lisa. Don't hold back. You seem a little bashful to play loud. But it's not even about playing loud. It's playing with more energy. It, you know what, what creates energy? How fast you go into the keys, how speedy your attacks are. If your attacks are sort of gentle, it doesn't matter how loud you want to play, the sound won't have a bite to it. But my device of, of playing like it's a hot potato produces a very quick uh, attack. And that's why when you play like that, it sounds better. So can you think of that? Just play faster into the keys with more bite. That's exactly it, Lisa. That's exactly it. Can you try it? The whole thing like that. Yes, it's telling that you didn't stop this time because you innately realized that this was sounding quite good. Right? You felt, yeah, this is going well. I don't need to stop. I, this is kind of what it should sound like. And it, it did. It was really good. Yeah. Um, okay, let's keep going. Very good. I know this is a scary moment. Um, you do it very well, actually. You manage those triplets excellently. Now, the, there are two runs of triplets. The first one, the right hand is not playing, only the left hand is playing. You're very brave to do it all with one hand. But you don't have to. You can break it up into two hands and it'll be much easier for you to play. So if you start your, your break on C sharp, you play with the right hand and you play second finger on C sharp and first finger on D. you have um, much more confidence of ripping that first run and that will set you up well for the subsequent runs. Can we try, um, yes, just try the right hand with the same energy you just played for me at measure 20. Yes, so I want you not to lose that energy as you go. And then uh, go to the next run. Play it on forte, don't play it piano. And remember what forte feels like. It's quick attacks. Yes. Yes, yes, exactly. So if you practice it like this, just practice the right hand by itself to get that really secure and, um, and it'll feel a lot more, you know, a lot more confident. And then you can play with more energy that way. So can you try to add left hand now? Yes, now I, I'd like to work on the left hand now. First of all, we have the chord in the right hand that finishes the previous phrase. And what I have in my score is staccatos and all those chords. And even if you don't, I would recommend making those staccatos. And not washing them out, not diluting them with pedaling. Because you want that energy to shine through. So can you do the hot potato staccato? Yes, very good. 
You can play even louder, even brighter. Exactly. Now, when the right hand played that last chord, left hand starts its run. So I'd like you to do just that much. Yes. So you see how your attention now goes to the left hand because it's harder. And the right hand sort of plays automatically now. It doesn't have that presence that you just showed me a moment ago. I want you to divide your attention and give some of it to the right hand. Play that chord with presence. Yes, meanwhile, left hand, try to crescendo it to the A. So play that A major scale on the crescendo to the last A. That's right. Starting like this will make it easier for you to play it. It'll sound faster without actually being faster. If you sit on the first note, then the whole thing will sag. So think forward, not backwards. Exactly, exactly. Beautiful. Now we're gonna finish with the right hand. Yes, now look how you finish the right hand. Right hand went kind of tapering off again. Do you recognize that weakness you, you, by now you kind of have it as a default setting? You taper all of your runs. You want to do the opposite. You want to have the runs being purposeful, having a goal. So show me where the run is going. Yes. Now everything just with more confidence, more, more presence. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Let's try to do this section all, all at once. Just do as much as you can from what we just worked on. a lot you you know you pl you played with a lot more nuance and um, color there was a lot more differentiation and articulation and you phrased better not it didn't come across a hundred percent I'm sure you noticed uh, those habits are holding fast you have to spend some time kicking them but um, but I could see a lot of a lot of intention so great job now, for the second run where you stopped, you're, you're figuring that probably it has a little bit of a split as well, and you're absolutely right. What you want to do play a scale in the left hand from C sharp to C sharp. And you can start, instead of starting with three, one, and then crossing over, Start with five, go five or three to one, and then cross over three and two. That's right. That's right. That's easier to manage. And then the right hand goes one to three, one to three. That's right. And now put it together. Yes. 
And Lisa, how, we, how from now on, how are you going to think of your scales? How are you going to shape them? Right. You're going to crescendo them instead of tapering them. This is how, this is kind of how you lose energy. It sounds like you're running out of steam when you play through them. So instead gather steam and go forward. That was beautiful, Lisa. Very courageous. Practice the right hand with the same kind of courage. Go to the C sharp. That's right. That's right. Now put them together. That's very good. Okay, let's keep going. Very good. Very good, Lisa. Um, right where you have those... What dynamic do you have there? Fortissima. Do you think you're playing fortissima? Probably not, right? If I asked. Yeah, yeah. So can you show me the energetic? You, you already know we just talked about how to do it. You just have to make up your mind to do it. Beautiful. Did you hear the contrast you made between the piano and forte? That's exactly how it's supposed to sound. I would love to hear how you're going to approach that with your newfound runs. Can you try to get the runs to go to the fortissima and then do exactly what you just did? That was great. That was great. I know we didn't look at the last run, and that's probably the hardest one, right? Yeah, because it's so intricate. It kind of loops around a little bit. Um, what I would advise is starting these kinds of intricate runs, start to practice them from end, not from the beginning to the end, but from the last part of it, and then go backwards. So. What's the most comfortable part of the run coming backwards? Yes. It's those five notes. One, two, three, four, five, right? Starting on an E. So that's where I would start practicing. I would play uh, like that from the end. And those five notes are already fortissima. That's how you make sure that you arrive at your intended dynamic by playing that dynamic prior to where it says you should play it. That way you know you're there. So let's practice those five, the run up, those five notes with the left hand. Left hand plays with F sharp. Let's practice them on fortissima. <laughs> And again, Lisa, notice how you're shaping that run. Are you shaping to B or away from B? That's right. That's right. Do you see how sneaky that habit is and how ingrained it is? You almost don't notice it. You think you're doing it. But actually, the opposite comes out. I think it's the movement of your hand. You involuntarily, you draw your hand away from the piano as you approach the last note. And that's what makes it taper. If you change the trajectory of how you behave, if you play into the piano, so the last movement goes directly inside the keys, then it won't happen anymore. That's right. Do you see how easy that was? Yeah. Okay. So now add one more note. Add the D sharp. Do 
That's right. And again, watch. Yes, that was good. You corrected it this time yourself. That was excellent. Then add one more note, which now makes it two triplets. That's right. That was very good. And now that you feel like, oh, this is not so hard, play it both of those um, beats. Play it fortissimo. Play it with a lot of articulation in the right hand. That's right. That's right. And once you achieve that fortissimo, right there, don't back away. Continue. Okay. Now I think we can do one more triplet. Very good. And once you get to the last two beats, you're already playing fortissimo. Remember that. That was great. Yeah, go into the B. Change your trajectory. Very good. Yeah, I know you hear it, that it's not quite getting there, right? So change your attack instead of out of the piano. Play now into the piano, very hot. On all of the notes, not just the first one. Yeah, and sustain that energy. That's it, that's it. Yes, now play the whole run. Okay, so your, your trouble spot is right in a, in a second triplet because you have to skip second finger. You have to go one, three, four, instead of one, two, three. Right? Is that what is that the fingering you're using? Good. Yeah, that's what trips you up. Your, your hand wants to play one, two, three, but you can't. But if you consciously think one, three, four, you'll feel more confident. That's right. That's absolutely right. You see how just consciously thinking of fingering really helped. Okay, so um, can you show me that glorious fortissima that you worked so hard to achieve and can sustain it throughout? Good, good. You'll work on it. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to, to get all at once, but you're, you're making great progress. Um, I'm going to ask about the time. I, I have a feeling we have to move on. Are the powers that be telling us that we have to wrap it up? Okay, okay. Well, Lisa, I have to say you've been so enjoyable to work with. Um, you're very smart and you have a lot of talent and you pick up on things very quickly and really I'm just wishing for you to keep going with this and to have more personal courage to make choices and to to play with with energy and enjoyment that's really all I'm wishing for you going forward great job thank you Hello. Hello. <laughs> How old are you? I'm 10. You're 10. Very nice to meet you. My name is Dr. Marina. And what is yours? I'm Anne Howard. Very nice to meet you, Anne. What are you going to play for me? I'm going to play for Kate Kubarkin. 
I love that piece. I can't wait to hear it.
Very good, Anne Valerie. Very, very good. You're so musical. And you play with a lot of heart. And I really love your colors and how you make the sound. You're, you have a really beautiful touch. You produce a very beautiful singing sound. I really love that. Um, I really don't have much to say about how you play it. I really love it. Um, <laughs> if it were me, I would play it a little bit, not so much faster, but I would think of units that I'm playing, like a phrase is a collection of notes, right? You have a phrase that has a number of notes in it. And it's up to us whether we play this line of notes in a straight fashion, going somewhere far into the future to shape that line. Or we're playing the same line, but with a lot of nuance along the way, and the, the line begins to look a little bit like this. So if I were to ask you which one of the two methods you're using to shape your phrases, would it be method number one, where you go straighter and shape more evenly towards the future goal, or it's something that you do short-term nuances and the line looks a little bit more like this? Um, I think I do maybe a little shorter. Time. You're correct. Yeah, you do, you do the second type. But if you were a listener, okay, and if you imagine somebody else doing the second type phrasing, would you like them to do that type of phrasing or would you rather they did something a little smoother and long term? I think maybe I would like them to do a little bit more smoother. A little bit what? A little bit more smoother. A little bit smoother, right? So as a listener, you like to hear something flowing smoothly. But as a player, it's interesting how our priorities change. We begin to phrase a bit more instantly. Like we want to phrase this three notes and then we want to phrase the next three notes and then we want to phrase the next four notes and we lose track of how smoothly we, we wanna flow. You're absolutely correct. So as a listener, I would wish for you to play smoother. But as a performer, right now you're playing a little bit wavy. So would you like to work on playing a bit more smooth? Yeah. Okay, okay, let's do it together. Um, playing smoothly, smoothly is a little bit like being on an airplane. Think of the airplane when it's on the ground. You're on ground level, you, you can't see beyond the first building. <laughs> your, perspe your perspective is limited by where you are. When the airplane takes off, you rise into the sky and suddenly your perspective is very different. You see far and wide. And your planning can change. You're like, oh, I can go from this point to this point using these streets instead of these streets that I was always using, but that's a longer way. I can, I can make a shortcut here, but it's because you're, you're looking at it from far off, you see? So playing longer phrases is a little bit like that, only orally. You have to change your perspective. Right now, you're listening to every beat or sometimes every note. I'm trying to imitate how you, how you played it. Does it feel slow to you? 
yeah yeah so that's a perspective on the ground you see where i i go from this building to that building to that building to that building because i can't see clearly where i'm going now if you want to see where you're going you have to rise up and look at the harmonies harmonies are where in the right hand or left hand In the left hand yeah. in the right hand right hand is melody right yes. so the chords are in the left hand and the chords are what creates harmonies so that's a G minor we know that because there are three notes and they create a G minor chord so we know it's G minor so right hand cannot do it because it only has single notes yeah. so long-term phrasing goes towards where the harmony changes and if you look at the phrase number one the harmony doesn't really change it goes from this chord to this chord and this chord is the same is that chord it's all G minor, right? Where is the first time the harmony changes? That's right. That's right. So the harmony begins to change only in the second half of the measure. So it's fair to say that the first half of the measure uh, phrase really doesn't, nothing much happens. We have an introduction. So what I'd like you to do is just to play for me the left hand, which contains that harmony, and play it very straight. Listen to how the uh, harmony just creates one big long chord. Just play until there. Very good. Especially towards the end, you really started moving in more smooth fashion. And how I can tell is because you stopped emphasizing each attack. You stopped emphasizing with your hand how you enter for each note. And you started playing more, more in one gesture. So you would kind of get the notes on your way up. So I wonder if you could do that for the beginning as well. Try it one more time. Yes, very good. So then the harmony changes. So you have two significant changes. One. one sounds more intense the first or the second the second sounds more intense to you can you bring the microphone closer to your mouth it sounds less intense which one the second one yes exactly so the first one sounds more intense and it's probably the, the apex, the high point of the phrase. That's where the phrase, if we were looking at it long term, that's where the phrase culminates in that more intense moment. 
and then with the second it dies down so I want you to play the left hand with those right hand chords like I just did more intense less intense do you see how I'm playing those chords yes the first one is I'm playing the chord in the fourth measure and then first chord in the fifth measure okay good that's right that's right can you play that with the basses And show me the difference between the more intense one and the less intense one. Make them very different from each other. Can you play the first one a little bit, a little bit stronger? And the second one a little bit softer. Exactly, exactly. So now let's go back and remind yourself how you're playing the first half of the phrase. and that's your story you see and you hear it now as full phrase because you're rising up in the air and looking at the harmony can you try it Okay, um, and Valerie, I'm gonna stop you here. So now that the right hand comes in, and I expected that, you have the way you play it, and you play the way you play it. So did you hear how your tempo changed yeah. when the right hand came in? Did it become faster or slower? Can you, can you put the mic to your mouth, please? The tempo became faster, you think? No, no. The left hand started, yeah. If you, if you continue to listen to the left hand, it slowed down. Yeah. Right. It's because the right hand. The right hand kept holding the left hand back. It kept delaying it. So now to get the, the right hand to sound the same flowing way that the left hand sounded i'm going to ask you to play the right hand as if it were a very beautiful scale can you play it just as a, as a d major make you know mixed scales actually it's a g minor melodic but that's right that's right so Play it very beautifully with your beautiful sound. Yes. And that's what the right hand would sound like when the left hand would, you know, give us that one G minor chord where nothing is still happening in the right hand, okay? Can you play it like this? That was very beautiful. That was very beautiful. So now, play it with utmost legata you can without slowing it down. 
you, you did very, very beautifully, but sometimes when we have a crossover, there is a little bit of a hiccup there. I know it's not easy, but try the best you can to navigate those crossovers as legata as you can. That was beautiful. Then show me the most intense part of the phrase. And then calmer, that's right. You just played a very beautiful phrase and it felt like one phrase. Did you like it? Good, I'm glad, I'm glad. It's important that you like how it sounds yourself. That means you can do it again in the future. So let us build on this success and play the second phrase. What I want you to do is play for me the right hand again as a scale. And show that this time, goes into a different harmony. So something is happening right there at the scale, not until the end. But the harmony does change there. So you have to react and play it a little bit louder. Yes, very good. I wouldn't die. I wouldn't die on the B flat major chord, on that chord. Don't phrase it down like that, because then the phrase is over, you see? And we have just begun. So keep the intensity. That's right. Then the next one. That's right. And the last one. That's right. And then the coda. really becoming a pro at that. Thank you. <laughs> that was quite good. Um, let's try it with both hands. Okay, so I I'm so sorry to stop you, but old habits die hard. And especially when the passage is not comfortable like this one. So you're making a musical stop, but I happen to know it's because the passage shifts right there. That's why you're making that stop. It's not really for musical reasons. So I want to now look at the complete pa passage. And when you cross from the chord to the single note, Describe to me the fingering you're using. Just play it and tell me what fingering you use. Like that chord, what fingers do you use? This one? This one? That, yeah. Two five. Two, five. Two, five. So you go... I see. Okay. And then from two five, what's, what finger plays the next note? What finger plays A? First, I see. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. We're gonna do a little exercise to make the first finger go there smoother. Um, first, I want you not to play the B flat. I want you to do an exercise where you go five, one, five, one, five, one, five, one. and feel that being as smooth as possible, go deeper into the notes and overlap your fingers slightly. That's right. Now we're going to go five, one, two, five, one, two. And make it as smooth as possible. That's it, that's much better, okay? Now we're going to play that chord but you're going to 
simply touch the B flat with your second finger and immediately change your wrist position. That's right, to prepare for the crossover. That's right. And play deeper into the keys. I know it feels counterintuitive, but it'll help. Play with cantabile. That's good. That's good. Now, can you add the previous chord and repeat the same thing? That's perfect. Perfect. Now play from the beginning. Yes, and we just went over that hurdle beautifully. It was very smooth. So, can, can you try it with both hands now? Very beautiful, very beautiful. You can use pedal. To help you. Very good, very good. So to finish this conversation about phrasing, I'm going to point out a, a rhythmic thing you do. I don't think you do it consciously. I think it's just uh, something you got used to doing a long time ago, and now it just happens. Um, you delay the timing of your chords. <laughs> ever so slightly, so instead of going straight into the next chord, you delay the timing of them. It probably happened because when you were first working on a piece, it was hard to set up those chords, so you took time doing that, and then that time just kind of stuck around. Right. But you hear how the phrase gets stuck if you delay. Yeah. And now you played it without delay and it sounded so smooth. So if you just watch it, that's right. If you play it like that, it'll help you a great deal. So I'd like you to play all those three, three um, groupings. much delay now that you know about it and only show me the difference in color how the first one is the most intense then the second one is less intense and the last one is the saddest one That was absolutely stunning. Such beautiful phrasing. Very simple and very beautiful. Did you like it? Okay. Um, so what I was saying is you still have a slight habit of delaying each arrival note. No doubt at one point you did it because it was expressive and you liked the sound of it and you liked it so much that you started doing it for every single one of them. But anything one does excessively begins to sound repetitive. So I would say don't do it until you feel really, really special about a note. But if you don't err on the side of being simple,
Beautiful. Keep going. Remember the smoothness of the scale? Yeah. Keep the tempo, keep the tempo. Keep the tempo. Yes, that was very well done, very well done. Um, did you hear how the tempo at one point started getting slower? Yeah, it did. Right, right, and then I prompted you and you, and you snapped back into it. Um, I loved when it was moving forward and not getting stuck so much. Even though it might feel musical at the moment, it doesn't help the airplane view yeah but that was very well done for the most part I feel that a special moment in all those phrases the one that you could save for and 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 make your signature delay that one because it's such an unexpected turn we expect G minor and what we get is a G major suddenly and so that for me is a really special moment that's worthy of of waiting for yes yes however I wouldn't set it up in such a way that you're kind of anticipating it on every note before that. If you anticipate the notes before that, then you sell it too, too soon, you know? So I would keep the coda flowing. Until that moment. Yes, yes, very well done. Um, and Valerie, make sure that you're not repeating the D, the bass D in the left hand on the downbeat of Poco Piumoso. That D is tied over from the previous measure. So all you're playing in the left hand is an upper B. Okay, so mark it in the score so you don't forget. All right, I would love to hear the previous phrase in totality so I could hear how you're making that transition. Would you mind starting? Not delaying any of those chords, but just making color changes. And then really emphasizing that special turn. Tempo, tempo, tempo. Your scale started limping again. Try to make it keep forward.
Beautiful, beautiful. I like your middle section very much. Thank you. I'm going to only say one thing about the middle section. And that is, it's written in chords in the right hand. The melody is now in chords. And the left hand kind of staggers with it. And so if we emphasize the rhythmic nature of how it's written too much, this kind of chord, 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 it begins to sound a little bit metric, a little bit too metric. Try to emphasize the melodic nature of this. It's a folk melody, really. It just happens to be written like this. But you want to play it smoothly and horizontally. Can you try it? much better I liked it much better and you kept the tempo flowing forward as well so that was very well done um, we must stop here it was an absolute pleasure to work with you um, I love your character and by the way I love the way you did this um, with this kind of proud proud posture that you had you you feel those moments very well so you're you're an absolute delight to work with. Um, I wish you all the best in your studies. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.